I didn't put up my lower third. I'm awesome. <sighs> Hello, everybody. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good middle of the night, wherever you are watching this um, from. Uh, I am Nicole Gallucci. Uh, I am with the STEM uh, Resource Center at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, and this is Learning Space, uh, produced in collaboration with CosmoQuest. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, there has been some changes to the show for 2015, as we discussed at the end of last year. Um, we are going to try and keep our weekly discussion and guest format uh, three to four weeks out of the month, depending how many Wednesdays there are in the month. Uh, but the second Wednesday of every month will be hosted by Pamela Gay. She'll be doing different topics for a project in collaboration with the International Year of Light. So uh, I just updated the schedule for that over on CosmoQuest.org. If you go to Educator Zone and Learning Space, uh, you can see the upcoming schedule of uh, topics. So today, I just got in late last night from a trip. Um, so I am uh, kind of just getting my things back together after a long weekend followed by a work trip. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Um, Gosh, I haven't had done a live show, I think, since the end of the year. So we started off this year uh, with a recorded version of uh, me putting together the parts for an itty bitty radio telescope. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today. So if you guys have any questions about the uh, recording or about what I talk about today, please use the Q&A app. Um, it says, please join the discussion uh, Q&A at the bottom of your screen so you can do that and send in questions and comments and all that good fun stuff. Um, so we have hellos from Nancy and Guido. So thank you guys for coming and saying hello and uh, for joining me today. Um, uh, coming up on the schedule, we've got some really cool topics planned. Uh, next week, I unfortunately won't be here. You'll have Georgia. Uh, She'll be uh, talking with Chuck Buter f uh, about paper plate astronomy. So another great thing we like to talk about on the show are uh, ways that you can demonstrate cool astronomical concepts without a lot of fancy equipment. Uh, so, so, so you're actually using paper plates to do demonstrations and classroom uh, activities. So they'll be talking about that next week. I will be across the river in St. Louis um, at a conference uh, talking about how to use Hangouts on Air. So uh, kind of unfortunate timing there. Uh, we have a few other guests uh, scheduled in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll be talking with James Dunbar, the writer and illustrator of The Universe Verse. I'm so excited about this because it, it is a, uh, a, uh, a series of comics books now, graphic novel um, about uh, science and the universe that's really beautifully drawn and really well written. So I'm really excited to have him on the show, uh, I think in late February. Uh, and then in March, we'll be talking about gastronomy, like yeses in the food and exoplanets. Um, and um, <clears throat> we've got a couple of open spots that I'm working to fill. So I need to get back to my email. We've got some uh, great people on the line who want to talk to us about things like having students do asteroid searches uh, and, and other cool topics. If you have a topic that you want us to cover, you can email us at learningspace at cosmoquest.org. Uh, you can also find me as Noisy Astronomer on Twitter and anywhere else on the internet. Uh, send me your suggestions, um, you can propose topics, guests, or uh, if you yourself have something cool you want to share, uh, let me know and uh, we will get you in the schedule. So that is kind of the overview of what's coming this year on Learning Space. Um, as I mentioned before, we will be switching, uh, we will be starting a, um, excuse me, a Patreon campaign to raise money to continue the show, uh, as as some of you may know, the CosmoQuest, uh, the NASA grant that was funding a lot of our CosmoQuest education programs ended in the end of December, uh, and the the entire grant program has been uh, shut down, so we couldn't apply for for more funding. Uh, so we are doing various things to keep uh, some programs running. So in this case, um, we're currently being covered by the. Uh, STEM Center at SIUE, and that's where uh, all of us kind of work. That's our department where we're housed, and so they are uh, keeping us going, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have that Patreon campaign so that you can subscribe um, and get some cool perks along the way when you subscribe for, you know, a few bucks a month uh, and to keep the show going. Um, so that is that now is all of the introductory learning space material. Uh, again, you can go to CosmoQuest.org. 
Uh, check out the new site layout. They did a really freaking good job uh, with the new new layout and new display, new ways of doing citizen science right on the front page. Uh, then go check out the Educator Zone, which is where uh, Learning Space lives. Uh, along with our upcoming schedule, um, I'll be posting links um, for upcoming shows. Uh, and our channel, we have a YouTube channel, we have Google, Google Plus page. Uh, so be sure to follow those because that's where all the shows will be showing up. Okay, now, now I think I'm done. <laughs> Sorry, I keep thinking of new things that I wanted to uh, to mention. So uh, I, I posted a video. So we, I had this concept called learning space quickies of these pre-recorded videos that we could do when uh, no one would be around, either we were traveling for conferences or holidays. Um, and so learning, we did uh, a few of them, not last summer, but the summer before, I think there was a whole month of quickies. And then I did one at the beginning of this year. Um, I posted a video where the video, the video quality did not come out as I expected. There was a syncing issue between my external webcam and my laptop, um, but hopefully all the audio is good and you got to see what you had to see um, for, for building an itty bitty radio telescope. An itty bitty radio telescope is a uh, kind of a demonstrator for how radio telescopes work. Um, its uh, main component is uh, two main components. One is a satellite TV dish. Uh, you can get these for free fairly easily depending on where you are. Um, I started asking around a couple years ago and people who had them and no longer subscribed to satellite TV uh, were like, sure, I'm just going to take it down anyway. They'd take it down and give it to me. Um, uh, websites like Craigslist or FreeCycle in the United States allow people to exchange goods. Um, FreeCycle uh, they have to be for free. Uh, Craigslist, you can be for um, a small fee or uh, free as well. And just see who in your neighborhood has them that's getting rid of them. So a couple of them I picked up that way. Um, and then the one I used in the video is really nice, uh, dark colored one with three channels. Um, it was uh, sitting next to the dumpster and in my <laughs> townhouse complex uh and and i picked it up and and brought it back with me while i was walking my dog and uh she was a little confused uh but that's okay i just walked it back put it in the house and continued on our walk um so check out that video uh that'll be that's linked from the learning space page it's on the learning space youtube channel um where you see me go through the steps of uh, what you need to do to connect that main piece i'm pointing to a part of my office because i have I have one back there. You can kind of see it, that dish, that gray dish in the corner. That's one that uh, I used for a summer camp. Oh my gosh, it's been a few months already. Uh, last summer, uh, May, I think we used it in May. Um, and then the back end, which is a signal meter, uh, which is used, uh, traditionally used to, to find the satellite that is giving off the TV signal you want to you know, be watching. Um, and so that signal meter is the thing that gets the, tells you how much power is coming, how much uh, stuff is coming into your, your itty bitty radio telescope. Uh, there's a little bit of, so if, with the particular model that I use, there's a little bit of soldering involved. Um, there's a little bit of wire stripping. And yes, I know I used kitchen scissors. I used kitchen shears to cut coax cable and you're not supposed to do that. Thank you for your comments. Uh, that is not the safest thing in the world. And I think I, I said that in the video, um, you know, you wire cutters and strippers, proper equipment that you can find at, you know, a place like Radio Shack is, is recommended. But uh, I sometimes make do with what I have. Um, so your mileage may vary there. This is obviously a project that if you have children working on, you want adult supervision. There are various resources uh, for building the itty bitty radio telescope. I just put in a Google itty bitty radio telescope and you get a great um, collection of, of resources. Um, let's see, uh, there is a description of how it is built from the SETI League. Um, Sorry, I want to get the uh, the building instructions up. I'm going to use the Showcase app. So if you're using the Q&A app, um, there's also a little there's a little tag that lets you switch between Q&A and Showcase. Uh, let's see. Let me take out the. I'll leave the page channels in there. Um, get your instructions up. There is a set of of instructions that I used. 
uh, from the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Uh, particularly, it's it's there's not much on the not much else on the page. It's just the description with pictures and the procedure. Um, it doesn't seem to be. It's not connected to a lot of things, but it is hosted out of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in New Mexico in the US, so uh, which is a place that I spent some time as an intern. Um, so that's the particular instructions I used. I'm going to put the link for that in the showcase, and I'll put them in the uh, show notes as well. So if you're listening afterwards, um, basically, you're connecting your signal meter to your telescope and then doing some soldering to get a power supply hooked up to the whole thing so that it works. Um, some further things that I didn't do in my video and I still haven't done for my dishes is to build a, a mount of some sort. Um, that that it, Those instructions show a tabletop mount where you can put it on a lazy suit and kind of like roll it around and tip it up and down so you can point anywhere in the sky. Uh, I know some people that have also mounted them on uh, tripods. Uh, Ray Sanders, who was one of our Cosmo Academy instructors um, a, a little while back, uh, built one that he put on a tripod. Uh, and I had another one on a tripod that I used when I was at the University of Virginia. So you can kind of, you know, use what mechanical things you have laying around um, if you have tool shed or toolbox or whatever to mount it. Uh, these are small enough that I just kind of pick it up. <laughs> and, and there's uh, a video, a little video at the end of me experimenting, uh, pointing it in different directions. So um, it's not a precision radio astronomy tool. Obviously, it is mostly a teaching tool uh, to show people um, that radio waves come from lots of different sources. Uh, in particular, you're going to see radio waves coming <laughs> coming from um, things in the sky and the bright sky source that you can see is the sun. The sun gives off quite a bit of radio waves that this particular machine can detect. Uh, I just caught a comment uh, from Adam. Uh, you've got my partner worried. She says, no way, no, 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 leave that dish alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I apologize for those of you whose partners will now be climbing the roof to remove dishes. Do so safely, obviously. Um, and if you can't, use one of the, you know, on, use use some some method like Craigslist to, to find, a, find one in your area, someone that's already taken it down. <laughs> so that that is kind of the easiest thing to do. Um, I have my, my partner was moving at the time that I was starting to collect these, and so he just pulled it off off the side of the house that he was moving out of anyway. Uh, <laughs> we now have several of these in our garage and he's grumbling at me that they, they're still there because um, I've only built two of them. Um, sorry, so back, back to the instructions. Um, watch that video uh, from two weeks ago to, to get an idea of how it comes together. What I wanted to, to touch on today um, is that I show you in that video that uh, you can point at the sun and you get a signal. And you point at the sky away from the sun and you, you don't get a signal, or at least the signal's weaker. And then you point at the ground. You can actually point it down at the ground or at a person um, and you'll get that strong signal again. So it may be a little counterintuitive, like why you're gonna turn on your itty bitty radio telescope and say there's radio signals everywhere. Um, and that is, that is true uh, in a way. I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is. Um, there is a concept. Um, do I have a picture? Uh, in, in physics and, and in astronomy, uh, a thing called a black body, which is not the best name for it. It is called a black body because it was um, modeled after like a, a box that was lined on the inside with pitch blend. So it was literally really super dark. Um, and something like that, uh, that is completely black in that way, uh, absorbs all electromagnetic radiation or light that hits it and then emits in every type of light as well. So here is a very simplistic diagram of that, that particular object. So this is mostly theoretical, but there are a lot of objects that act very similar to this, but not perfectly like this. Um, so we call what it does, we call it black body radiation. How much
much light or radiation, I'm going to use those terms interchangeably, um, if, if I do by accident, when I say radiation, in this case, I mean light, um, visible or invisible light, it gives off all of this light in different wavelengths. And how strong it is for each wavelength depends on the temperature of that object itself, the, the black body. So if you had, I'm going to show you a graph. If you had a, uh, a black body uh, of a certain temperature, it's going to give off light all across the electromagnetic spectrum. Here's that simplified graph. OK, so you have. On the x-axis here, you have wavelength. Uh, in this case, you have sh sorry, short wavelength at the left end going to longer wavelength here at the right. So you can imagine that being gamma ray, x-ray, ultraviolet. This section here, 400 to 700 nanometers, is the visible light spectrum. Uh, and then you go into infrared, microwave, and then out to all the radio wavelengths. So all across the electromagnetic spectrum, you're going to measure the flux, or how much light is coming off of that object. Um, so for each wavelength, each wavelength, you measure the flux, and you make a point. You measure the flux, and you make a point. You measure the flux, and you make a point. And this is showing the points for three different objects. Um, there, if your object is cooler, in this case, this is comparing three types of stars. This is typical for optical astronomy. A red star is cooler. It's only 4,000 Kelvin, so only 4,000, about 4,000 degrees uh, Celsius uh, is actually a cool star. How much light it gives off depends on the temperature. It peaks at a certain wavelength. It's kind of over in the red. That's why it's the color red. And it gives off, a, but it gives off a little bit of radiation in all of these wavelengths. The yellow star is a bit hotter. It's at 6,000 degrees uh, or 6,000 Kelvin. Notice I'm not saying degrees Kelvin. If you're going to get pedantic about that, I didn't say that. I'm just uh, switching between Kelvin and Celsius. Um, so that is giving off more flux at every wavelength. And its peak is shifted uh, over here, a little bit towards the middle of the optical spectrum. And so, hey, you get a yellow star. The blue star uh, has, uh, if you measure how much light is coming off at every wavelength, you get more radiation, more light at every wavelength. And the peak or the maximum is in the blue. That's why it's blue. Awesome. Well, stars aren't the only things that give off light. Guess what you do, too? Uh, a human is about uh, 300 Kelvin. Um, so that's going to be, that would make a curve that's much lower and it would peak in the infrared. Turns out you're the brightest in the infrared. So if you turn all the lights off in a room, you won't see people glowing with your eyes because, you know, your eyes, uh, don't, uh, detect infrared radiation by definition. Uh, but if you used a, a heat sensing camera, an infrared camera, that would see in a dark room. And that's the, the basis of, of, of night vision goggles, for example, night vision cameras, is that they're seeing uh, in the infrared, they're seeing um, the warm objects as they're giving off heat. So, okay, so stars give off light, we give off light. Uh, anything with a temperature above zero Kelvin, absolute zero, gives off some kind of light. Uh, so even though there's a very long, low tail at the radio end, everything gives off a little bit of radio waves. And uh, a radio telescope can actually uh, determine, I'm not going to get too much into this, but a radio telescope can determine uh, the temperature of an object if it's giving off light in a, in a certain way, in a way that uh, makes it act like a black body, we'll say. Um, so occasionally, you will actually, when radio astronomers talk amongst each other, we don't always talk about the brightness of an object. Sometimes we talk about its temperature as if we were using the radio telescope to measure its temperature. Uh, and in some cases, we really are. Some cases we're not, and we use temperature anyway, but I won't get too much into that. But basically, uh, if you look, if you point your radio telescope at the ground, that's got, you know, maybe 300 Kelvin or a little higher, a little lower than that. 
uh, you're actually picking up the radio signals from from that the warm earth same thing if you put a person in front of your itty bitty radio telescope when you point at the sky um, you do have atmosphere that that could have a temperature but it's it's weak enough it's weak enough at these frequencies that you're looking at um, that signal that it doesn't really pick up. When you're looking at what we call cold sky or sky with no sources that can be detected by your itty bitty instrument, uh, that's when your signal will be low. And then you point it at something like the sun or a person, uh, things that are warmer or hotter, you're gonna get that signal. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird concept to wrap your head around, but it explains why you're gonna get a signal when you point at the ground or uh, people with this particular instrument. You can also uh, put things that obviously give off radio waves in front of it, like a cell phone. If you take a cell phone, um, a smartphone with a, the LCD screen will give off lots of radio uh, waves. If you've got a fitness tracker of some sort, these give off a lot of uh, radio signals I've discovered in doing this. Um, so you can test, you can you know put your electronics in front of your dish and see um, what those give off. Uh, there are certain, um, people have been developing lessons for these itty bitty radio telescopes to use in the classroom or for informal education with kids. Um, <clears throat> they are in different stages of development. Uh, so I'll include some of those here. So um, again, from the, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, there is a uh, there is an, <clears throat> an activity called, what is it? What can it do? And so um, talks a little bit about what it can do. So I'll put a link to that one. But the one actually I like better is put out by the SETI League. The SETI League is a group of uh, amateur SETI uh, searchers. So SETI is a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, you may have heard of this before. They primarily use radio telescopes to search for signals from extraterrestrial civilizations awesome and far out and cool um but it's not a very well-funded project um so the study league is actually a group of private individuals that uh help with such searches there are such things as amateur radio astronomers and and you know sorry for everybody else but they are the coolest people <laughs> they are the coolest people i know or have met um because they're pretty hardcore about their equipment um so the study league also posts instructions on how to build an itty bitty radio telescope. And it has a great um, PDF for activities, what to do with the itty bitty radio telescope. Although you can't do detailed astronomy with it, what you can do is teach some fundamentals of using, um, of using a dish, using a radio telescope of any kind. So you can uh, do things like measure the beam pattern, the, the antenna response based on direction um, using the itty bitty radio telescope and you can gather data and, and look at that. And I, I particularly like that one. So if you're doing something that is, is, uh, kind of, if you want to do something that's kind of engineering related, uh, you can do that. So I'm going to post those links over in the showcase as well, and I'll put them in the, um, show notes for you all to see. Also, I'm not sure how well the PDF will come up in the showcase, but that's that's something to get started. Um, and then there are people who have gone out and, and done some more um, sophisticated things with their itty bitty radio telescope. Let's see if I can find it. Um, there is a, a website called uh, stargazing.net um, that has uh, somebody who has hooked up an itty bitty radio telescope to a data computer data collection system so that they can actually measure the um, brightness of the sun um, <clears throat> at this particular frequency at 12 gigahertz uh, and display that on a computer. So I'm going to include that link as well because I'm super impressed at that. Um, okay, so that's the itty bitty and I'm going to check over the questions because uh, I saw one. Uh, I said, Douglas Crandell says, I have an old Prime Star dish that would work for this. So yay, you already have stuff you can do. Um, Nicole got a bar stamp. No, I have notes on my hand from class. That is what is on my hand. It is not a bar stamp. <laughs> Although if it was, I would probably not even tell you. Um, and uh, Guido asked, can you pick up any other celestial object other than the sun with the ABD radio telescope? It's probably not sensitive enough and too hard to point. Um, 
At 12 gigahertz, the sun is one of the brightest things in the sky. Um, there are there's a supernova remnant called Cassiopeia A, and a 12 gigahertz. Mm, yeah, the, the next brightest things in the sky depends on the frequency. Low frequencies where I used to work, uh, Cassiopeia A, supernova remnant, and Cygnus A, radio galaxy, were brighter than the sun. At 12 gigahertz, which is the frequency this works at, they're not as bright as the sun. Uh, also, they're smaller. They're really tiny sources. Whereas your your one pixel itty bitty radio telescopes like has a really large pixel on the sky. Um, so your tiny sources might get swamped by the, the noise around it. Um, whereas the sun having a half degree um, will show up a little bit better. So that the really the, the best, the only celestial object this can, as far as I know, uh, as far as I've heard and seen, uh, is the sun. You can move up to a bigger system to do something a little brighter. There's a, a project, there's a, a kit that used to be available, and it's not available anymore, but I think the specifications are online. You have uh, the, the funding and or time and or inclination. Uh, so Itty Bitty Radio Telescope is the DISH Network version. There's one called uh, the Very Small Radio Telescope. <laughs> Again, with names, we are so clever. Uh, this was developed um, with support from, NF, from the National Science Foundation in the US at MIT Haystack Observatory. Uh, and they used to have a company that made them, but I don't think they do anymore. Um, let me get a picture of one of these. Oh, I wish I had a picture of the one I used to use. Um, Assembly manual. Yeah, I really can't find the picture. Um, this is using a larger dish, um, but still parts that you can get fairly findable commercial parts um, for the VSRT. Uh, when I was an undergrad at a small college, uh, we had one on the roof of our academic center uh, that one of the professors purchased and, and put together um, for us to use. Let me get this picture up. VSRT. The SRT. Actually, I think we called it the SRT at the time, small radio telescope, but now it's called the very small radio telescope. So this is the SRT or the VSR, VSRT. Um, this is the one at Haystack Observatory uh, in, in Massachusetts, uh, where uh, both Pamela Gay and I had internships at different points <laughs> with the same advisor. So fun fact there. We both worked at MIT for the same person, but at different very different times. Um, so that's what it looks like when it's set up. It's a bit of a bigger dish, so it's more sensitive. Uh, one of the really cool projects you can do with this is uh, map the hydrogen in the galaxy. Uh, so I, I had a friend in college, Aaron Mastrantonio, who uh, used it to map. You can actually measure the rotation curve of the galaxy by looking at the emission of hydrogen gas uh, with this telescope. So this one, um, is is uh, quite a bit more advanced. I, I don't know kind of what the pricing is is for it, uh, and they've they've put out, but they've put out free software to um, to analyze that data. So I'll put the very small radio telescope uh, out there. Uh, occasionally, I see projects. Whoops. Occasionally, I see projects at um, astronomy conferences or astronomy education conferences where people are doing different things with it. And um, particular, uh, somebody was trying to do. Back in 2003 when I was there, uh, one of the summer students was using two of them to do an in interferometry. And I know there's been various attempts at doing cool interferometry with that. Uh, again, it's a you can kind of do some basic astronomy and, and, and basic uh, understanding of electronics through systems like that. Um, so that that's one that's kind of one step up from the itty bitty. I'm trying to add the link to showcase. Um, and, and like I said, uh, the amateur radio astronomers are the people to talk to if you're interested in, in pursuing radio astronomy as a hobby. Um, oops, added more links to the showcase. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, SARA, um, is a group that I met when they were out in Green Bank for one of their, they, they go out to Green Bank, I think once a year, uh, for a conference. And, um, that's, that's a group that you can hook up with, uh, whereas amateur optical astronomers tend to have a lot, you know, there are lots of local groups. Uh, this is kind of the one big consortium for amateur radio astronomers. Uh, so Sarah, Society 
radio astronomers. I'll just add that link in there as well. Um, that's the place I would, it's, oh, good. It's radio-astronomy.org. <laughs> awesome. Um, so those are the people to talk to. There's some new technologies coming out um, that, that let you use radios in, in even easier ways to make uh, receivers and telescopes. Uh, and I know that there are talks of um, radio citizen science, radio astronomy citizen science projects that involve building telescopes uh, that are the talk stage. So of course you'll hear from me uh, as soon as uh, that that ever comes to fruition. Um, let me check and see if there are any more questions about the itty bitty radio telescope. Uh, so make sure you use the, the uh, Q&A app. Whoops. Is there an array? Okay, Michael Jobin asks, is there an array phasing box available? Not that I know of. So when you use uh, more than one antenna as an interferometer, you, they have to, you don't just care about the brightness or the intensity of the light coming in, light wave, you also care about the phase. Uh, and so that would help. And I don't know of array phasing boxes that are available. Um, again, there have there, 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 been some student projects to do in interferometry. I don't think you would, honestly, if you had, if <laughs> I'm going to talk about my experience at long wavelengths, uh, as long as you have equal cable lengths for your two things, um, your, your two antennas, your multiple antennas, if you have equal cable lengths, e similar, you know, equal electronics and all of them, you, you shouldn't need to do anything extra. Um, the, the phase information will tell you what direction of the sky your, your object is in or where in your, your beam pattern the, uh, the object that you're looking at is in. So uh, if well built, if built exactly the same, you wouldn't need to do anything extra um, to get that to work. That is, that's been my experience working at really long wavelengths um, with stuff like that. I say that long wavelengths uh, matter. Um, the error that you're allowed uh, in uh, something that you're, you're, you're building uh, scales with the wavelength. So if you have a long wavelength, so long wavelength radio waves, um, think, you know, kilohertz. <laughs> well, astronomers, we think megahertz, but you know, even further for, for, for ham radio kilohertz or lower, um, you can get away with uh, bigger errors in, in your system, how big and small you build things. Um, the smaller, the shorter the wavelength, the more precisely you have to build your system. Um, which is why the millimeter wave telescopes like the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in Chile, ALMA, uh, had to be built very precisely because it's tiny, tiny, tiny wavelengths of light that it's trying to, to pick up. Um, you won't see anybody walking on the surface of an ALMA dish the way you occasionally see people walking on the surface of a very large array. Um, at least back in the day, I don't know if they still do it uh, um, because those work at longer wavelengths. So that's an interesting tidbit. Um, one more thing I want to point you to if you are interested in, in the basics of radio astronomy. Um, I took a graduate level course called Essential Radio Astronomy uh, at University of Virginia uh, by Jim Condon and Scott Ransom, two astronomers of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, and they've put all of their materials um, online. They didn't really like any of the textbooks available, so they, they made online materials. So if you Google Essential Radio Astronomy, or look at the link that I'm going to share. Um, it was a graduate course, but it is uh, appropriate for someone with uh, an, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's appropriate for upper level undergrad. Um, so if you have experience in, in physics, uh, if you can look, you know, if you're okay with, if you're okay with equations, if you're okay with a little bit of, a little bit of calculus, I think in here, um, you know, basics of physics, uh, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, then you could actually look at that. So that's that's at a, a kind of an advanced undergraduate level if you're interested in in radio astronomy and what's behind it. Um, I'll share that link as well in the showcase in the show notes. You can check that out anytime. Um, I think it was really great. And I think I I, I heard that um, they were going to record some of the lectures too. I don't know if that ever happened. Um, partly because uh, Jim Condon. 
uh, had so many great stories about the earlier decades of the development of radio astronomy that he would interject in the lectures. Uh, and that, that alone was worth uh, recording. So. so I will share all of the links for the itty bitty radio telescope, the activities you can do in the classroom. Um, and uh, how to build it, uh, as well as some basic radio astronomy. And I'll also see if I can find, there's a recorded uh, telecon that um, I think the Night Sky Network did about the itty bitty radio telescope. I don't know if I can find that. I don't know if that's publicly available, um, but you know, uh, Sue Ann Heatherly is one of the educators in Green Bank, West Virginia, and she, uh, you know, builds these and has students use them and talks about it. So she's a, a great resource for that. Um, that's all I have for today's episode. So uh, I will post all those resources in the show notes. If you're listening, if you're watching, if you're listening later. Um, so yeah. Um, oh yeah, and Michael Jobin uh, said yes. I'm talking about multiple dish arrays. Yes, if you have multiple dishes. Like I said about the phasing, you may not necessarily, if you build each one the same, then you may not need to worry about phasing. So that, that's kind of what that was about. Um, let's see, next week, like I said, uh, on Learning Space, uh, you'll have Georgia Bracey hosting, uh, talking about paper plate astronomy uh, with our guest. And uh, check the schedule to see what's coming up next. Uh, Friday is the weekly space hangout hosted by Fraser Kane. Um, that is at noon Pacific, right? Noon Pacific. Um, you can check uh, check his uh, Fraser Kane's Google Plus page for all the time zone conversions for that. Uh, it'll be your weekly roundup of news and astronomy, and I'm going to try and join join this week uh, if, I, if I have time on Friday. Fridays are tough. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get things done. Um, and then Monday, Monday at noon Pacific uh, is the broadcast of Astronomy Cast with Pamela Gay, Fraser Kane. Uh, they'll do a live recording of their podcast. Uh, about some topic in astronomy, and I don't, I'm actually not up on what topics they've been doing lately, so check the Astronomy Cast uh, YouTube channel and Google Plus page for more information on that. Uh, so go do some science, uh, go to CosmoQuest.org, do some citizen science uh, with uh, the Moon, Mercury, and Vesta, uh, or try building a radio kit of your own, uh, and you can always email me any questions, uh, learningspace at cosmoquest.org. You can reach me personally at noisyastronomer at gmail.com. And thank you, everybody, for watching. See you later. Doo -doo -doo.